Sayyidatuas. Ladies and gentlemen, your honorable guest of Egypt on the third day of the conference on the support and development of the Egyptian economy, where all the attendees have come to join us in building Egypt the future. Throughout the past two days, we have witnessed the different events and the signing of rich agreements focusing on partnership and the fruitful cooperation. Today is the third day of the conference on the support and the development of the Egyptian economy, and which will witness uh, uh, different events that will be the best conclusion for this uh, gathering. We will witness several events, different panels, that will focus on the financing of the emerging markets and the role of the SMEs and the vocational training and investment in the future of Egypt. Techno technology and innovation is the solving of the most urgent problems in Egypt. Sports, development, adherence and unity and investment opportunities in addition to different workshops and uh, uh, events. Our third meeting will start with a panel on uh, the financing of the emerging markets. The capital markets were classified as the best uh, the stock markets in the past year, and many emerging markets like uh, mode, real estate mortgage, SMEs, and micro enterprises have witnessed great developments. That what are the criteria for the emerging markets and what will happen with the Egyptian markets? What are the variables that we expect in the financial field? In uh, this panel, we will have Mr. Th Talib Sami, the CEO of the Financial Supervisory Authority from Egypt. Mr. Mohammed Omran, chairman of the Egyptian Exchange and the Federation of Euro Asian Stock Exchanges Egypt. Mr. Shalmoun from uh, uh, Chairman of Foreign Trade in Morocco. Mr. Tirad El Sheikh Mahmoud, the CEO the Abu Dhabi Islamic Bank, the United Arab Emirates. Mr. Chain Nelson, the group CEO, Emirates National Bank, United Arab Emirates. Mr. Alex Thursby, CEO of the group, the NBAG, the United Arab Emirates. The panel would be moderated by Mr. Michael Georgi, Bureau Chief Egypt and Sudan Thomson Reuters. Uh, today we'll be discussing financing of emerging markets. And to kick us off, Sharif will discuss changes in regulatory framework over the last 18 months or so and future challenges. Good morning, everyone. I know it's the third day and you're tired, but uh, we have a, a, a varied audience and in, in, in a very short uh, time, you know, we have very important message to deliver. Non-banking financial services encompasses, you know, capital markets, securitization, insurance, private pension funds, leasing, factoring, and very recently we had a mortgage, of course, and microfinance. We've been listening to projects, mega projects, and huge projects yesterday, the day before. They all need finance. The challenge is uh, how to really uh, update you on what happened in the past six quarters. Um, a lot of changes, mainly on the capital markets, which Dr. Omran will elaborate on. Mainly, we're trying really to push it to, to regain its uh, glamour of having IPOs, but more importantly for debt instruments as well. We recognize that it is an untapped source for financing companies on, uh, uh, with bonds uh, and securitizations. 
I was happy to hear yesterday the Minister of Finance finally spelling out the word Sukuk. Uh, EFSA, as a regulator, we've drafted changes to the capital market laws since last May. Uh, they are in the government's drawer. Among the changes are Sukuks. We believe it is an important instrument to add to our uh, capital market portfolio. So I'm glad the government is, is more excited about it. Uh, insurance, uh, we have several insurance um, heads with us. Insurance is, is, is important in two fronts. One of them, definitely, uh, we are underdeveloped and underpenetrated in insurance. There is room for new players. And more importantly, one of the, long, uh, the big long-term investors in Egypt are insurance and private pension funds. Together, uh, they invest around 100 billion Egyptian pounds and I'm talking here 31 insurance company and around 600 private pension funds. It is a sector that is not getting enough uh, recognition and highlight. We're working on developing it. A new law is almost done for insurance. The executive regulation of private pension funds was done. Uh, leasing and, and factoring are not uh, really, uh, um, you know, uh, forgotten. The figures are growing by 15 to 20 percent a year. Yesterday, leasing contracts among companies were around a billion USD. Factoring, a more recent industry, is half of that. We see it growing, and we see these two areas especially important for SMEs and for microfinance as well. Microfinance, our latest addition, as you know, the law was issued three, four months ago. Now we have 80 NGOs licensed a company, and we're talking to three or four players. I imagine by mid-2015, we will have at least five companies for the first time in Egypt's history licensed for microfinance. Without taking too much time, what we're saying, we are pushing for more diversification in non-banking finance tools. And then our other focus you know, we have several uh, ministers in, in this room. They all have projects that cannot be financed by the public treasury. It has its limits. The Ministry of Supply is having beautiful projects for logistics, uh, for wheat uh, storage and so on. We have revenue bonds and long-term instruments. We have t two ministers of education, whether it's technical education or the general education. Building schools is a very long-term financing uh, instrument. We have real estate funds. We have, they can securitize. When you go to school, it's a 14-year con contract between the student and the school. Definitely securitizable. Definitely it is a, a nice play for real estate investment funds because they know the product is sold and they can have 20 and 30-year leases for a lot of schools. The product are there for technical education as well workshops, leasing is a good instrument for them, you know, to, uh, to be able to upgrade their workshops and do technical training. So our mandate is really the whole market, but we have a special focus on government and public authorities because we believe financial engineering is yet uh, to take, uh, you know, more strengths and be uh, at a higher level with all the uh, the key projects we've been hearing, and I'm sorry I took too much time, but our portfolio is, is really diversified. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Mohammed, can you tell us what role the stock market can play in financing? What plans you have? Yeah, I guess uh, what Reham was mentioning in the intro this morning about the Egyptian exchange and the capital market in Egypt, and I think she was mentioning the Financial Times report that Egypt was a top destination in 2014. And for me, as a chairman of the stock market, I'm not looking for only a return for investors, how much the main index went up by 30% or 26% during 2014, which makes Egypt the second best performing in emerging market according to the Morgan Stanley index. But also, I'm looking for the idea of how market is functioning. And the, in this sense, I like always to look to the figures and numbers. Numbers talk for the EGX 2014 for several reasons. In 2014, 
we have the highest value traded in the market in terms of turnover ratio since 2010, just one year before the revolution. In 2014, we have 13 newly listed companies with a paid up capital of 1.9 billion Egyptian pound. This is not a very big number, but if you look to the relative term, this is 10 times what we have in 2013, 10 times. And it is doubling what we have in 2011, 2012, and 2013 together. So just look to the how significant the relative term is, how the market is coming back to work again and to function again. The third issue is about whether the market provides the needed finance for the listed companies or not. It is. Why? Because one third of listed companies went for a capital increases in 2014. 72 listed companies out of 224 in the main market went for capital increases. And this is a very important message because even for the international investors, even for the local investors, when they are entering the market, entering the economy, they would like to invest, they would like to look to two things actually. If there is a, a good capital market with the best practice rules and regulation on governance issues, which will be able to provide needed financing for the companies or not? And the, the answer is yes, because one third of the companies went for a capital increases. So when they have any investment opportunity, if they would like to expand their business, there is a market here. It is not only the banking sector, but there is also the capital market. And the very important issue is about the exit, because when you have the entering the company, the, the country, you would like to understand whether you'll be able to exit in the right time, with a simple way, with the right valuation or not. So we say that, yes, the market will be able to provide that. And look to what's happening now. In 2015, for example, in the first couple of months in 2014, we will be able to attract five newly listed companies with a bid up capital of the entire 2014, two billion Egyptian pound. Today, as we are talking after only 30 minutes, it will be the second IPO in the market since 2015. Because the first one was last week, Raskin Construction, which is your listing between NASDAQ, uh, Dubai, and the Egyptian exchange. Today, we have a food industry company, Isida, with an IBO of 2 billion Egyptian pound. And as you understand, we did list AMR Egypt, who is a very big company, and we are expecting more to come. So the message is very clear that we have a capital market that is functioning well, that can help listed companies, can attract newly companies to be listed, can provide investors the nice exit, the nice capital increases. And this is what international investors exactly need to understand when they are entering a country for newly uh, in investment issues, project they would like to understand they can find the needed finance. And when they exit in five to seven to 10 years, they will find the capital market that can help them. The last thing about the EGX is not only about the number, but even the, even the international recognition for the EGX. In 2014, in September, in New York Stock Exchange, Egypt was the winner of the best innovative stock exchange in Africa. That was a competition there with the five African stock exchanges. Egypt won this prize in September 2014. Couple of months later, I was elected as the chairman of the Federation of Euro-Asian Exchanges, 34 exchanges there, so EGX is the chairman now of this. In the meantime, we kept our position as a, a, a board member in the African Stock Exchange for the fourth time in a row, the only exchange that keep its position for fourth time, four times. And I think Sharif was about to talk about it, I think if he has the chance about that, about the doing business. If you look to the doing business report that issued from the IFC and the World Bank, the entire country moved one step forward because of one issue. is the newly listed new regulation about the listing and disclosure requirement in which the thing is related to the investor protection and the related part transaction went to 12 degree in this issue, which has made the entire country move one degree in terms of doing business reform. So the issue is not only about the how much return for investor, but all these things related to rules, the regulation, governance, capital increases, IBO, newly listed companies. I think we have a very good story to tell about the EJX in 2014 and the, the years to come. Okay. Shane, could you share your views on this and, for instance, the, the mortgage financing, what state that's in in Egypt, what can improve? Um, I, think, I think one of the things I'd say is if I look at pri uh, private sector debt to, uh, to 
the GDP in Egypt is actually quite low. And, and banks here are very liquid. Most banks uh, run advanced deposit ratios about 40%. So this, the, the system itself is, is quite liquid and, and has the capacity to, to fund most projects. But I think one of the things that uh, is surprising is that um, the engine in Egypt um, is, G is actually SMEs. They, they represent about 80% of GDP, yet their financing um, is only about 6% share of, that, of, the, of the credit wallet. So there's a real capacity there for the banking system, I think, to, to really uh, re-energize SMEs and, and finance them a lot more aggressively than, than they are. But what does that need? I think transparency in financials is really important because banks can't lend on um, a, a set of numbers that aren't, uh, aren't legitimate. So tax collection and monitoring of tax collection is important so that we make sure that the numbers are correct. Um, but the appetite is there um, to, to grow. Um, I think the, the other thing that um, when you're looking at uh, how, how um, bankers finance in emerging markets is often with SMEs, it's against a title. So it's against, it's a mortgage to allow them to, to finance. And I think um, there's some improvement needed in, um, from the land uh, and, and titles department and the speed of that they're issuing t uh, titles because that will enable not only um, SMEs to, to get uh, better financing, but also it will create jobs in the construction industry if we can actually uh, increase our mortgage penetration here. Um, if you look at mortgage penetration in, uh, in Egypt, it's only about 2%. It's very low. Um, it's about a third of Turkey, for example. So I think the, the capacity for the, the, the system internally to generate a lot more jobs, uh, a, a generate a lot more capital for SMEs um, and for individuals is, is there right now. So you think there needs to be a lot more focus on this? We've heard about the Suez Canal and the investment law and various other incentives. What, what do you think the government should do? And how quickly? Well, the, the, the government actually has some pretty good SME uh, programs in place. Um, but if you look at places like Thailand, they have a very good SME process um, using banks um, where there's a, sh a, a, a share of loss uh, within, the, within the banking system. And that works very effectively. Pushes banks into that SME um, uh, area. And uh, given that it's 80% of, uh, of GDP, it's a very important area for, for Egypt to really push hard on. And I think some of it is the, the central bank and the government e encouraging banks to actually lend into that sector. But again, transparency is very important in the numbers. Okay. Tirad, what's your view on, on what needs to be done in the next three years or so? In well, terms of if finance? you allow me just to say a couple of things before I answer your question. We've been in Egypt, Abu Dhabi Established Bank, since the end of 2007. Um, we have seen the volatility and I can tell you that our operations have never been interrupted. We are the fastest growing bank in Egypt and we're very, very happy to be here. This country is very hospitable. Money goes where it's wanted and it stays where it's well treated. So we have been fairly well treated in Egypt. There are a lot of investment opportunities here and we have acted as a bridge to uh, facilitate those investment opportunities. Uh, we can't go into names, uh, this, is, uh, this is something we don't do in banking, but we have facilitated acquisition of a steel plant, we have facilitated the acquisition of agricultural uh, land, we have facilitated major investments in real estate, all this money came from uh, the GCC. And I think this conference and the countries that have come to rally around Egypt will create a lot of momentum of more investment coming into this country. The things that we would like to see are very simple things. I think all the solutions are available within Egypt. What my colleague Shane spoke about is quite relevant in terms of making sure that the SMEs become part of the uh, transparent uh, uh, part of the economy where banks can actually engage deeply. We're currently engaged with large corporates because their financials are much more reliable and we're engaged with the small, um, you know, with, with, with retail finance, which, which is basically salary based. We want to be into the SME business. Uh, another area where I think Egypt has begun uh, to talk about in very positive terms, and that is you know, their willingness to apply inclusion as a policy for capital, uh, their willingness to bring Sharia compliant um, criteria uh, into the capital markets that to allow Sharia compliant funds to come into Egypt is highly encouraging. Egypt has to consider the fact that the UK, Malaysia, France, 
Germany, Dubai, Bahrain, they're all competing for the same thing. They want capital to come into their markets, and I think Egypt deserves the best. They have to apply policies of inclusion to bring in Sharia-compliant funds. Sharia-compliant funds seek long-term investments, and Egypt needs a lot of, a lot of that. We, we look to do infrastructure finance, we look to do manufacturing finance, real estate finance, and our capital uh, works with certain uh, you know, Sharia-compliant uh, criteria. We can't deviate from that. We're very much interested to be in Egypt, and we're looking forward to more opportunities uh, to be presented to us. How would you compare Egypt to other countries in the region in terms of opportunities? Egypt is, look, I mean, Egypt is the deepest market in the Middle East, all right? Um, there is very little that we can say about what cannot be done here. Uh, manufacturing of furniture, Egypt has a big history on that. Uh, textiles, Egypt has a big history on that. Uh, a lot of things can be done in Egypt. And the SME sector, if you just think about Italy, which is an SME-based economy, if you think of the SME sector in Egypt and think about the manufacturing potential that, that, that we can reap in that area, the potential is enormous. You have a young population looking for a job, looking for an opportunity to be productive, and you have a big consumption market. If you just look at the import substitution benefit by applying basic manufacturing uh, uh, you know, things in the market, the, the sky is the limit. I'm not exaggerating. Actually, I do believe the sky is the limit. There is a lot of potential here. Regulations in Egypt have to be streamlined. There is too many regulations. Um, you need many lawyers to explain to you what can go wrong with respect to your investment environment. The civil servants in this country have absolutely no incentive to make decisions. If they make a mistake, they go to jail because of the complex regulations that we have. So I think what can be done is streamline regulations, uh, open up a bit to bring in inclusion policies to bring in more capital into the country, uh, look at the SMEs and focus on building local manufacturing capabilities. The country has that potential. This is not a startup country. Egypt is thousands of years old. It's not a startup country. So we have the historical capability to leverage again and move forward. Thank you. <laughs> Alex, do you agree with that assessment? Yeah, look, um, <clears throat> I think there is just so many opportunities. And uh, just before I start, I think we will reflect in five years' time that this has been a real turning point for Egypt. Um, there's a sense, we get the sense that there is a sense of real wish to change and move forward quickly. And uh, I certainly walk away as the chief executive of uh, MBAD very positive of what I see. Um, of course, there'll be some volatility, um, but uh, as a bank who's been here 40 years um, and has been terribly committed to the, to the country, we see this as a huge opportunity for, uh, for our shareholders. Um, my sense is that one of the challenges that we have at the moment is to get long-term finance into the system for the projects that are broadly based on utilities, um, energy, but then we'll start to develop into the private sector in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a big way. And I think industrialization, logistics, finance uh, will start to take a major part. And I think one of the critical things that we believe will emerge, and we certainly will be at the lead at, is to try and develop the local bond market for corporations. And um, the liquidity, is, as Shane, I think, suggested, is definitively in the market. Um, and it's uh, a lot of liquidity in local currency that can be activated. And I think, if nothing else, the Indusuez bond showed the power of that liquidity from individuals, never mind institutions. So I think one of the keys that we'll be working on is to get that local bond market moving. I think also an access of liquidity, uh, maybe even in hard currency later, uh, will be the offshore in Egyptians, um, who are numerous around various parts of the world. And uh, their dedication to the country recently in supporting the real estate market will also be another active investor to uh, uh, attack. 
the second area I think that's very important again is um, uh, is very much in the Islamic finance sukuk market. This market globally now is growing at about 50% per annum, and we expect that to accelerate over the next three to four years. And the investor base is extremely broad. It ranges from Asia. Hong Kong is a, an active uh, investor market for Sukuk Finance for Northeast Asia. Malaysia, London, and of course Abu Dhabi, Dubai. And we believe that those four centers will be the activation of the investor market, which is the key. In addition, uh, I'm sure that the Sukuk market from an investor space will develop as, uh, as I talked about a little bit earlier on long-term bonds. Um, this is, uh, will be very beneficial. You tend to find in this type of marketplace at the moment, investors are long-term investors, they sit. It's not generally uh, investors who arbitrage markets and trade, etc which gives you a level of comfort and gives you a level of confidence when volatility comes. And the most recent example was in Hong Kong, uh, where there was some uh, action uh, base in the um, you know, demonstrations, etc. The Sukuk market did not move one basis point for the Hong Kong Monetary Authority Sukuk. And this indicates that to me that there is a stability which I think would be very advantageous for Egypt. The third area I think is very, very important and is important today. And we certainly in NBAD will take a lead for this. Um, export finance is critical. Building the foreign reserves of the country as she builds her infrastructure, she pays for her uh, various investments that she's making across a broad strand is, is critical. And products like structured trade finance I think will emerge very quickly. In fact. We've already seen a major transaction that we were involved in done at the end of last year, uh, and I think this will only accelerate. The criticality of this type of finance is it takes investors and bankers away from ratings. And I'd like to give you a little example. I was personally involved in the uh, Ghana Coca Board financing uh, some 22 years ago. And that first transaction was done for $50 million it was done at a rate of around about 3.5% over LIBOR for agriculture, pre-export agriculture finance uh, for cocoa out of Ghana. Today, those transactions are now 1.5 to $2 billion. They're somewhere between 25 basis points and 50 basis points. So there is a country that is being perceived as a higher risk, being able to access uh, in a very, uh, bankable proposition, low-cost funding. And I think particularly as the agriculture sector develops, this is an area where it will be very, very key. And I think the challenge for us as MBAD is to activate this type of finance quickly into the market. It will be good to help build the reserves, stimulate exports, create future cash flows in hard currency that I think will be critical over the next five to 10 years. Thank you. So, yes, please, can you react to that? Yeah. Trying to, to avoid the new question, to reflect on very interesting uh, points that were raised. Uh, obviously, inclusion is, is very important. You know, we're all working on it, each in his own uh, domain. And it starts actually by education. I am, enjoy the position of being a regulator who is not government. So I can have a dialogue with the ministers and tell them we really need to include a lot of indirect message in our curricula, you know, since a very young age about saving, about insurance, even in a math course, you know, it could be all the terminology about finance, the stock market, you know, and, and this is very important. Start at, it starts at an early age and then it grows over two. So the inclusion is important on, on the regulatory front. As you know, a regulator, in an emerging market where the developer hat and, uh, and a regulator, because they go hand in hand, we're working on micro-insurance, which is very important to include a lot of low-income uh, uh, segments of the population. We have a new law and we're working uh, on it. And of course, microfinance, which we're happy to, to, uh, to have seen uh, pass. 
together, I think they will add a lot of inclusion. Uh, you, there was uh, talk about mortgage. Mortgage also helps in inclusion because we have in Egypt a subsidy, a mortgage subsidy fund to make it more affordable for low income people. The real problem you hit on the nail, on the head, as they say, in mortgage, we have a very serious issue in title registration. Tazgir al-Aqari, 90% plus of our units are either uh, not uh, registered or you know, it, uh, it doesn't have a license because it is in breach of one code or the other, and the result is it can't be financed. With the new communities and what we've seen, the new capital plan, I think the more uh, new lands being uh, offered, it will help you know, include a larger proportion of, of mortgage clients. Plus, we definitely, definitely, as a government and as a country, need to revamp our title registration uh, plans. Otherwise, a big portion of our wealth sits unrecognized. Again, I'm going quickly. Uh, Sharia compliance is important. As a regulator, our board of EFSA adopted an approach that we will never say it is Sharia compliance. We will structure it, we will include it. It looks compliant, it smells compliant, but we will not say it is compliant. But however, a Sharia board of the register of you know, competent scholars that we register according to certain criteria, like auditors and like independent financial advisors, they are professionals who will come in a board of three and say that fund is Sharia compliant, that insurance company is Sharia compliant. As a financial regulator, we do not want to be, you know, a, a religious authority. We would like to have a portfolio of products and let everyone decide how to use it. I think this uh, is the right way to go, and we believe it should be added to our portfolio of products. <laughs> in infrastructure, I'm sorry, I'm taking too Thank much time, but we have too, much, too many points. Definitely, even the G20 and the Financial Stability Board uh, meeting in, in, uh, in Basel last week says infrastructure is very important. It puts a challenge on the banks and the non-banking for longer term tools. Uh, do you know who is the richest lady in this room with more money to invest? It's our Minister of, of Social Security. She has all the private pensions and public pensions. So we want to come up with long term products for her <laughs> public insurance funds to invest in, in a very objective way. They have to do their homework, but we have to avail long-term instruments that are rated and credible for the boards of our very rich public uh, pension funds to invest in. It's the same as insurance company. We have the chairman of our insurance federation. He know his companies are sitting on 50 billion pounds. They are looking for long-term. Uh, I mean, life insurance is a 30-year investment. It's beautiful, it matches very well infrastructure fi uh, finance. We need the tools, and definitely the government has to set a benchmark for 20-year lending and 30-year. We don't have that benchmark today. Finally, uh, on a final note, I want to mention that uh, in a new law we have drafted and it's sent to the government, it's for uh, moving good registration. That law, uh, is important if you do leasing, if you lend to small, we mentioned SMEs, you know, a, a piece of machinery and equipment, a dentist uh, seat, an x-ray piece of equipment, that register would guarantee ownership and, and uh, hence reduce the risk for lending to the small people, which we could further encourage banks and, and non-banking financial services, you know, to inject money. As you mentioned, it's very important to have a small businesses finance, not necessarily from, from banks, but from all the stacks that are available. Thank you very much. So if I could ask a broad question, we have two distinguished officials here. Could you compare dealing with this government with the past government, for instance, in terms of how they tackle challenges in, in, this, in this sector? I was very blessed to have very good relations with both governments. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, you know, Egypt is one of the very few countries around the world that included in its constitution, you know, an article explicitly saying the, the non-banking financial regulator is independent. 
I mean, we obviously meet, we talk on the phone, but they can't come and say license that or, uh, you know, delist this. I'd like to use the time also, we have new products on our exchange. The chairman of the exchange never had the time to mention them, but we have to say what's new in our exchange, you know, the ETFs and others, so if you don't mind. New products, ETFs, yeah. trust listing with the foreign market. I mean, I mean it, it was very nice to hear, it was a music to my ears, when the, the banker said about two important issues about the uh, debt market, fixed income, and the SEEs. One we have it, which is SEEs, I think in 2007, it was the new board platform for SEEs. Now we are standing at 35 listed companies in SEEs, and by the way, EGX is the only stock market in the region in which we have a platform for a small and medium-sized enterprise. This is a market cap of over one billion, as you can bound. And even last year in 2014, the, ba the turnover ratio was about 70 percent, double the turn turnover ratio in the main market. The second issue is about the fixed income, and everybody here would like to see a fixed income in our stock exchange. The stock exchanges in the region, in the entire region, not only in Egypt, it's an equity-driven exchange. And wh what we are missing is to have a fixed income, and we should start with the with the sovereign bonds. Actually, if you look to the treasury bonds here, I think quarter of a trillion Egyptian pounds are uh, treasury bonds. And I think we have many comprehensive meeting: uh, the EGX, the IFSA, the central bank, the primary dealers, Minister of Finance, and everybody understanding we need to have this market. But the priority different because for the EFSA and EGX, its first priority might be not the same for the central bank and the Minister of Finance, but I'm sure they are convinced about the idea, and we reach an understanding that this fixed income will start with the sovereign bond very soon, might be sometime during 2015. The third issue in which I would like to take this opportunity, because here, a couple of ministers in front of me, the Minister of Social uh, Solidarity, actually, and she was visiting the stock exchange, and only 1% of the state pensions are invested in stock market. Even she was happy because she wanted that she made a 22 percent during 2014, which is a very uh, big number actually as a rate of return. And I, we would I, like to see at least. I recall she said she wanted a lady to be the head of the stock exchange as well. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so we'd like to see more than one percent. And the second issue in which I ask the government and I keep meeting several ministers and Dr. Khaled Hanafi is here because I talked with her with him uh, a couple of weeks ago is that this stock exchange is not for the private companies. It is as well for the state-owned enterprises. And the word privatization, for God's sake, we have to be afraid of that. I mean, we are talking about very large number of state-owned assets. You can use the stock market to capitalize on what we have in terms of liquidity to ask for capital increases. Many companies need to uh, having a new line of production. They need to move from the, the, the uh, the city itself to the industrial zones, for example, they need a huge investment. But I don't know why the government is still shy of joining the stock market. Might be because of the old term privatization and people do not like this term. But in this issue, there's something called privatization by capitalization. The government is not selling existing shares or part of existing companies, but they will join the stock market to ask for a capital increases and they let the public at large to join the, to join the, 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 the government itself. And the idea is not only about having investment from the public at large, but there is a very important issue. Government is an agent to manage this company. They are not an owner for this company. They are agent on behalf of the citizen at large. Citizen would like to understand how these companies are managed, how they are performing. Having them in the stock market, it is like a thermometer, is a monitoring what is happening in this company. So I take this panel to urge the government to use the stock market. It has been more than 10 years. I did not see a single state on the company join the stock exchange. I think it's a time to be done. And this uh, stock exchange is a state owned and the government should use it as a private sector if they do that. So I'm taking this opportunity to ask all the government to join the stock market using our platform to provide capital increases for the state owned companies. You can tell we are really independent, right? <laughs> <laughs> could, you, could you expand on why you're facing resistance? Sorry? Could you expand on why you're facing resistance in this it's, drive? It is not a, a matter of resistance, 
but it's a matter of understanding because it has been before in 1995, 96 until 2002 when we have privatization program. And then we have a revolution 2011 in which everybody were questioning the, the way the privatization is done. But privatization is, is, is not a nice word or a warning, but we need the public to understand that selling the state on assets is not a bad thing. We need to have the private sector to manage the economy, and you need to convince the public at large in this issue we are not selling existing shares. We are just using the platform called the stock exchange to having a capital. If economy. we call it this is the people participation, maybe it's a better word than privatization and it delivers the same. I mean, change the name and. and we can the change the name, call it whatever you like, yeah. but the, 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 the most important issue, please, let citizen at large monitoring their own assets. Government is an agent. They are not an owner in this question. So let us monitor what we have as citizen at large. Okay, we don't have much time left. Could I ask each one of you to just state briefly what you think the biggest challenges are ahead in the next couple of years or so for finance. Yes, could you? I, I think the number of opportunities that were created in the last 12 months is, is huge. And, um, you know, so the demand does exist and there is enormous government support for these initiatives to make them viable and successful. Um, the challenge probably right now is just to make sure that supply and demand meets. And we have some mandates ourselves, Abu Dhabi Islamic Bank Egypt, um, you know, our investment banking division have taken mandates from the government to bring these uh, opportunities to the capital markets. I'm glad to report that we have been very successful. I think in the next few days you will hear about announcements of how these deals were closed. So I don't see a challenge that is in the classical sense something that we have to overcome. I think right now it's the normal business as usual challenge to, to make demand meet supply. In the next 12 months, everybody will be obviously hoping that their expectations are being met. The expectations have been elevated to a very high position right now. And, and with, with high expectations, the pressure goes on everybody to make sure that we meet these expectations. So the, the only thing I'm hoping for, praying for, and discussing with my colleagues is that we have raised expectations all around. We now have to make sure that every step is well calculated and in the same direction. Go ahead. I'd say um, uh, Emirates MBD invested about 500 million US about 18 months ago um, of buying Bank National Macquarie's uh, business here. Um, it's one of the few um, acquisitions I've seen in, in, in my history as a banker that actually has beat acquisition forecasts. So we, we're in front of the, the original uh, model that we built. That says a lot about the country. You know, the, the demographics are so strong. Um, the opportunity with, with credit availability is there. And I think one of the challenges is harnessing the liquidity into the market um, rather than it just sit, sit around. Um, the, the banks are under lent and there's plenty of opportunity there if we can just get some of the basic infrastructure right. There's a very good credit bureau here uh, that the central banks put in place. All the infrastructure is coming, but there are some, just some basic stuff I think we can accelerate the growth. I think one of the big challenges is going to be with the big projects is foreign exchange. How do we get the foreign exchange to the country, make sure all the reserves are built, um, it's, it's always going to be a challenge for the next few years until, as, as Alex said, we build that, that infrastructure that generates internal um, with, through exports the, the, that, that, uh, that foreign exchange. So I think that's going to be the challenge for the next couple of years is, is around the foreign exchange. Certainly um, uh, the Gulf countries and contributing heavily to, to Egypt will help that, that position. Um, but I think that's probably the biggest challenge we're going to face. Yeah, look, I think, um, just taking up what Shane said, I think there is a, a critical challenge, but an opportunity. Um, I've never seen a banking system for a long time that has the liquidity that this system has. And accessing that gift by banks, uh, lending more, but also giving investors, uh, including individuals, the opportunity to apply their savings in a different manner. So. 
the innovation of the local bond market, which is created for the corporations to invest, not to be crowded out by government, I think is, uh, is key. The second, again, is to um, avail, for Egypt to avail itself of the liquidity pools that sit around the world and have different views. We saw the Chinese yesterday. I think it's a good opportunity to tap their liquidity pools uh, for hard currency lending, which is done in a constructive way, which will be for the long term good for the those who lend, which will only be a self, a, a, a virtuous circle. And I think if 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 the uh, regulators and government can help facilitate that, and then let the banking system both internationally and locally activate that, then I think the rest will drain through. I think the third challenge uh, for the SME market, and if you look at SME markets all over the world, lending is important, but SMEs also need something else. They need timely payments. They need them to be cheap. They need trade finance, which is uh, reasonably priced. They need to be able to avail themselves of foreign exchange. All of these issues are critical for medium-sized enterprises. And if you look globally, the wallet for medium-sized enterprises globally is actually about 60% uh, for banking services outside lending. And to make sure that the industry here reacts to the customer needs quickly and modernizes and supplies those products to those customers, well, if, if it does, then the kickstart that that will give when you've got an economy that is 80% uh, reliant on SMEs uh, will be enormous. It will just make them better and it will make the economy much better. Uh, but again, I emphasize we are confident uh, as a long-term investor that these will be taken on. And the last um, six months has been quite amazing in terms of the regulatory changes that will start to free up this economy. Thank you very much to our panelists. Thank you.